Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Critics of New York City often scoff that they could never live in a city so dominated by concrete, steel, and glass, and possessing so little natural beauty. But Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, urban planner and expert on New York City's natural light, gives the lie to that assessment. Arguably, no one has done more to take inventory of the ecological wonders that New York City possesses. In her latest book, she takes us on a tour of some of the city's greenest spaces, each of which would be a source of pride for any city, and which are constantly being altered by both nature and human hands. Green Metropolis, the extraordinary landscapes of New York City as nature, history, and design, has just been published by Alfred A. Knopf. Welcome. When I go home uh, to Alabama to visit, uh, it's always a challenge for me finding places to walk, to be close to the water, to, ex to see greenery, to experience nature. And then I come back to New York City and go for a walk in Central Park or ride my bike along the river and conclude that New York City uh, seems to offer more places for, experience, for people to experience nature than many other cities. And that seems to be um, a theme of your book. It is indeed a theme of my book. We have an abundance of nature here in New York, and it's wonderful to do what you do, which is to bike along the Hudson River, or to take a walk in the Ramble in Central Park, or to go up to the north end of Manhattan to Enwood Hill and pretend that you're off in the Catskill somewhere on a trail. So how did a nice um, Wellesley girl graduate get into the parks business? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question for you. Uh, I went after Wellesley. Um, I um, went to Yale City Planning School. I got my master's degree there. But always back then, it wasn't master planning that I wanted to do. It was open space planning. And then I came to New York to live. I really wanted this great city to be my home for, as it has been, uh, for nearly half a century now. And I knew, though, I still wanted to be close to nature. I'd had a very nature-rich childhood growing up in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I joined a group called the Park Association. It's now called New Yorkers for Parks. And I began to see the whole city, the outer boroughs as well as Central Park, and garbage dumping, uh, encroachments by building construction, um, pollution, things were bad. And so I was a you know, girl activist protesting. And then um, after my first book, which is called The Forests and Wetlands of New York City, which is an outgrowth of that experience and really a predecessor of the current book. I wrote a book on Frederick Law Olmsted. It's called Frederick Law Olmsted's New York. And I thought Central Park is a great American masterpiece. And at that point, if you remember the 70s, it was disgusting. It was crime-ridden, drug dealers, muggings, graffiti everywhere. And I thought this is a great shame. And so like Pollyanna, uh, it was very bad. The city was in fiscal crisis. And anyway, like holding up a candle in the darkness, I had a little group called the Central Park Task Force. And we had kids in there weeding. We called them summer interns and some volunteers. And I knew there had to be a plan, a big sustained effort to really restore the park. Didn't know how to do that until Ed Koch, was elected mayor, and his first commissioner, park commissioner, Gordon Davis. Gordon saw Who was a great I, parks commissioner, by the way. Oh, indeed he was. He, uh, and the greatest thing he did, of course, was to see what I was doing and to bring me into his administration and give me the title Central Park Administrator, but no budget. So out of that situation grows the Central Park Conservancy, because I knew we had to have a board, like the boards of the 
American Museum of Natural History, the Botanical Garden, the Metropolitan Museum, a board that it was prestigious enough and strong enough to raise real money to restore the park. Does the Conservancy have an endowment? I would think it would. Does it have an endowment? Oh, yes, and it has okay. a good endowment. And people have been incredibly generous. This, this is a citizen effort, and it's the first partnership, public-private partnership, between citizens and municipal government in the country. And the word conservancy didn't even exist until I coined it. And now there are many conservancies in other cities because the idea took hold that people could really help their parks if municipal government was not doing a good job. I, you know, I've been to a lot of parks around the world, and I have never seen a park that I thought was more beautiful than Central Park. Um, people tend to think of it being as totally nat natural, uh, but as you write in your book, it was a huge public works project. What kind of undertaking was that, and what made it so successful? It, it's the most brilliant 19th century engineering infrastructure with an overlay of this incredibly beautiful naturalistic landscape. Most people think you just put a wall around it and that's so untrue. All of the uh, low ground was dredged to make the lakes. The magnificent rocks, many were left in place. You see the beautiful rock outcrops of Manhattan schists that I talk about in my book. Uh, some of the rock, a lot of the rock was, they had stone quarries right in the park. So buildings such as the Belvedere Castle were built of the same Manhattan schist stone, uh, grading hundreds of thousands of cartloads of topsoil were brought in. The little stream that you see running through the ramble, that's all man-made. The lake is man-made, everything. And nobody really realizes that, which is the point. It's wonderful. And there were, there were actually people, there were communities living in the park, and they had to be moved, relocated. There was one community. Uh, there's always been a little controversy, Seneca Village, and that uh, there was reimbursement. There were lots of little scattered plots, and they all had to be acquired. The city had issue bonds and then uh, acquire and compensate the owners for the taking of the land. And I don't think it was done ruthlessly, but yes, you're right. There, people did have to be moved. What was it about the geographic and geological makeup of New York City that allowed it to develop into such a great port city and eventually a city of skyscrapers? I know it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to give me the total answer, but okay. what were the features? The question of, of, you mean the bones of New York? The, right. The structure of the landscape itself. Uh, okay, well, uh, let's go back to geology and say that the last great glacier, the Wisconsin sheet of ice, comes down from Canada and it's shoving its way along and it stops passes over Central Park, you see the grooves and the rocks, the sediments that were pushed across those rocks and scratched them. And uh, then you see uh, all along Long Island and Brooklyn, the terminal moraine, this you know dumping of the load of the glacier as it then retreated. All right, so it crosses Long Island and then Staten Island, and then the process creates this great harbor. And so New York is destined to become a great port city because of that. And you have Long Island Sound, you have the Hudson River, the East River, and I think that it is this great coastal location with water all around it. That's one of the prime features of the shape of the land. So the city dumps have a fascinating history. 
um, New York City, like most big cities in, a, in an earlier time, was pretty filthy and stinky. Uh, you write that uh, it was pigs who were the garbage uh, collectors of their day. And at some point, the decision was made to start dumping garbage in the city's marshes. And you, you created this landfill. I guess Fresh Kills was the last. Um, um, and Fresh Kills is going to be a public park at some point, right? It'll take 30 years because right now, if you go there, you it's not open generally to the public. They have days called sneak peek days, and you can go in and you'll see these pipes uh, coming out of the ground uh, to release methane mm -hmm. that is still in the ground. Uh, some of that is the blue power plant, and some of that is actually going to provide energy for some of the homes of uh, Staten Island. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that all of our wetlands were destroyed by, by dumping by garbage, and that's only the largest and the last one. But you'll see the city. I think of it like a green skirt, a fringe of wetlands. Many, many parts, Pelham Bay, um, sections of Manhattan, all were wetlands. And then the city grew, and then you had construction debris filling out, filling out. Uh, Manhattan is bigger than it once was. Uh, and besides the construction debris, you have all of this garbage. In the 19th century, you have the carcasses of the uh, horses and the cattle and, you know, the offal from the butchers, the waste. I mean, it is really <clears throat> a, a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And so these so-called sanitary landfills are what were created on the marshlands. And they did clean up the city. They did, correct? Well, it, they are part of the city. Right, right. They are, they are the city along with the rest. Right. Uh, of the uh, of the landscape, but where do they yes, take it, where do they take the garbage now out of state? You know, I'm not totally sure, but it has to be shipped. I think it's either shipped by boat or train. I think it must go down. You, they're strip mining sites. I'm thinking Pennsylvania, West Virginia. I'm being vague on this, right? But I think it has to be shipped out uh, and uh, taken to other locations. Okay. We're I hope it's not being dumped in the ocean because yeah. that, it's, it's not, I'm sure of that, because that would be a great source of, of uh, pollution. Right. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Elizabeth Barlow Rogers. <music> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, whose latest book, Green Metropolis, the extraordinary landscapes of New York City as nature, history, and design has just been published by Alfred A. Knopf. Um, in your book, you, you focus on seven green spaces. Uh, and, and we'll talk about some of them, not all of them, but some of them. Um, you talk about the natural wonders of Staten Island, uh, including, and who knew you could go foraging for mushrooms uh, there? And you talk about, the, and the 17 year cycle of the, is it cicadas? Is that what mm -hmm. you call them? That's Tell me a little about that. Well, it was such a remarkable experience. Uh, the way in which I saw these parks, I could certainly go on my own as you can, but I wanted to learn more from the people who are real habitués, who know these, love these, are passionate about these places. And in this case, Mike Feller, who had formerly been a, had the title naturalist in the park department, he was my particular buddy. And it was so wonderful talking with him. This is a remarkable thing. These cicadas, they're different broods that breed of the same species of cicada. And then uh, when they breed, they bury their larva in the ground, and it only emerges after 17 years. So they're all on a 17-year cycle. The brood that is in the woodland at High Rock in Staten Island is the one that we saw, and we happen to be there. I think we're now talking 
oh gosh, three years ago. And this was the time that these cicadas emerged. And there was all this whirring in the trees, the sound uh, was shrill. And it was just amazing to look and see where they had come out of the ground and then to see uh, the uh, way in which they slip out of their ectoskeletons that encase them, and then uh, they breed, and uh, that's it. Those cicadas die, and then their young come out of the ground 17 years later. Are, are they like, I mean, I, are they like locusts? Are they like butterflies? Are no, they're they? locusts. They're, they're, so they, they used to be called, uh, I heard of them referred to as 17-year locusts, so okay. they, they seem like locusts, but technically they're cicadas. Okay, okay. Um, Jamaica Bay, um, which at one time was a huge breeding ground for oysters and was a place where the airports were created, again, on landfilled. Um, and there's now a Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. How was it created and what does one find there? Well, how was it created is an interesting story. Um, and Robert Moses, who's called the master builder or the power broker, as is the title of uh, Robert Caro's wonderful book, he. Uh, obtained authority over Jamaica Bay back in the, um, I guess this must have been the early 50s. He was park commissioner from 1934 to 1961. He um, had, there was a deal with the um, transit department was building the subway and they had to excavate some of the sandy bay bottom and had it mounded so that it created these two ponds and created of a place and called it a wildlife refuge. Not that he was very environmentally oriented, but nevertheless, uh, there it was. And so he put a, a park department employee, a horticultural employee out there. There's a little house where Herb Johnson lived, and Herb, um, he simply got the uh, seeds from pine, black pines on Jacob Reese Park and the Rockaways, and he uh, got beach grass, and he dissed in the beach grass, and planted trees and shrubs, and the birds came because of the ponds and because of the wildlife habitat that he created. Now, the uh, refuge is run by the National Park Service. It's part of the Gateway National Recreation Area. And so I first visited it when it was part of the Parks Department, but now you can go and take the same trails around those ponds, and it's a wonderful Can you go experience. out on a boat and... Well, you walk those trails, you go to the visitor center, walk the trails, but I did go out in a boat again with one of my um, wonderful, let's call them mentors, named Don Reapy. And he has a boat and he's named it the Guardian of the Bay. And he really is uh, the Guardian of the Bay. And I went out and I went out with a group of volunteers from of uh, the Church of God mm -hmm. uh, and planted marsh grass on uh, one of the marsh islands. And so, yes, but all can kinds go of, out, but not, not the, the public doesn't. Right, tremble. all kinds of birds. Uh, are there oysters again? Not really oysters mm -hmm. again. Okay. Uh, the bay uh, was still polluted, I think. Okay. <clears throat> Who knew that in Woodhill Park that there was a dense forest in it? Well, I discovered, I knew. <laughs> and now we'll know. Uh, now right. we know. Um, the Center Park Ramble, you said, is one of your favorite places to go to. I, it, I've always found it very scary. I, I get in there. I, you know, I get lost. I can't get out. I think, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. So I tend to avoid it. But you would not recommend avoiding the Ramble. We're going to change your attitude about the ramble. The uh, ramble used to be just what you said. It felt vaguely sinister, 
and uh, the bird watchers never avoided it because it's a magnet for birds. But you had to be careful. There was a lot of muggings back in the 70s. One of the great things that uh, the innovations of the Central Park Conservancy is the zone gardener system. Now all of the zones of Central Park have people that care for them, that are mostly horticulturally trained, they do maintenance and they do planting. And the Ramble uh, is a very different place. When you take away the graffiti, when you clean up an area of the park, when it's kept garbage free, when it's weeded, when it's beautifully planted, all of those things make it much more welcoming. And it doesn't attract crime, I would imagine. And it no longer attracts crime. It did, but it no longer does. So you have to take a walk in the ramble as soon as possible. Okay. <laughs> Um, the High Line, obviously one of the city's, city's most popular and coolest uh, parks, a tourist attraction. Um, I had not known about, I mean, you'd hear about Diane von Fur Furstenberg and some of the prominent people's involvement in making a reality. I had not known about Robert Hammond, who was a business consultant and involved in internet marketing, and Joshua David, a freelance writer, who were really the motivators, the, the, the original prime movers, came up with the idea. It was really remarkable. Uh, Robert came and talked to me because, again, the Central Park Conservancy is a model for uh, these other kinds of citizen endeavors. And it was such a wonderful but implausible idea. Here was this abandoned piece of transportation infrastructure, a spur that used to take uh, from the uh, docks on the west side, the Hudson River, uh, produce, not produce so much as, uh, it went to the meat market, it was, you know, turkeys, frozen turkeys and, and beef, went down to the old Washington Street market and unloaded in those warehouses down there. Well then, after that function ceased to exist, uh, there's this abandoned, piece of railroad track. And the city was going to tear it down in the Giuliani administration. The developers were ready to develop the real estate. And Robert and Josh, Joshua David, went to a community board hearing. And they thought, that's a stupid idea. And so they decided to write friends email and say this is not such a good idea and it was just remarkable and they really got the ball rolling they got it rolling and it was still improbable but again just as in central park citizens grasped the idea city hall mike bloomberg's administration they did great things for parks and mayor mike got it and so did the city council. So they gave some support. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Robert's a genius at fundraising. And they have a really nice look to all their publications. In the beginning, um, Robert said, we were just two guys with a logo. And from that, uh, they developed all the support. And as they say, the rest is history. Are they still very much involved with the, with the High Line? Oh, indeed. Point? Robert is, uh, I think you'd call him the president or the, you know, executive director. I don't know what his title is, mm -hmm. but he is still there. Josh has another job now, um, but he's still involved. I mean, for both of these uh, men, uh, this will be their greatest life accomplishment. And, and Robert is still there. Okay. Well, it's a fascinating book. And, I mean, we don't have time to talk about, you know, uh, the other green wonders that you write about in it, but you know, people just need to read the book and they'll find out about places that they didn't know um, that are, exist in New York City. So, I'm afraid we're out of time. My thanks to Elizabeth Barlow Rogers for joining me. Her latest book, Green Metropolis, The Extraordinary Landscapes of New York City as Nature, History, and Design has just been published by Alfred A. Knopf for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.
If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.